It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search it out is the glory of kings. This is the Message to Kings podcast. Episode 263, The Circumcision of Jesus and the Blood of Christ. In the courtyard of women, every day, two devoted followers of God come to pray. Each of them had invested their life to pray for the coming Messiah. Each of them had spent decades devoted in prayer. Each of them knew the Messiah was coming, and they knew it with the sincerity of their heart. They trusted in faith. They trusted that God was going to come and perform wonders, that the Messiah was coming. And each of them, at over 80 years old, knew in their heart of hearts he was coming. But he wouldn't show until the day of his circumcision in the temple courts. On the eighth day, baby Jesus would be brought to Jerusalem to be circumcised and dedicated to God. In essence, it was his dedication. But more than this, it was the fulfillment of the dedication of the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant comes from the blessing or prophecy of Abraham spoken in Genesis 12.1. The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, your father's household, to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So the blessing has three parts, the promise of land, the promise of descendants, and the promise of blessing and redemption. God required of Abraham his commitment and the act of circumcision, Genesis 17, 9. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. So what is circumcision? Circumcision is the surgical removal of the foreskin of a male. The word circumcised literally means to cut around. And here's an interesting aspect to it. It's one of those sovereignty nuggets of God hidden in the Bible. One wonders why the eighth day, right? And the reason is that God created babies as such that on the eighth day, the baby produces enough vitamin K to clot the bleeding. Any day before that would actually pose a health risk. Isn't that amazing? God made man in this way, or babies in this way, and set in stone in the days of the B.C. Bible days, as early as 1400 B.C. Science wasn't able to confirm this for thousands of years. Isn't God amazing? The Bible is full of amazing revelations of things God knew before that would only be be revealed later by science. There are hundreds of them in the Bible, and maybe that would be better for another podcast special one day. Now, circumcision isn't required as Christians today, but it was required of Old Testament Jews back then. It's complicated, but the book of Romans details how this isn't required anymore. And doctors debate the true health benefits of circumcision today. Regardless, it was the cutting away of the flesh as a covenant with God. Its symbolism and meaning are remarkable. A cutting away the unneeded flesh is technically what circumcision is. Isn't this our Christian walk? The cutting away of the flesh to fully walk in the spirit with God. The war of this flesh versus the spirit. Where God's Holy Spirit, which dwells within us, wins supreme over any desires of the flesh. Just cut it off. Cut off the flesh, drown it out, walk in the spirit of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't just drown out the flesh. Don't just separate it, cut it off. Now, Joseph and Mary are walking to Jerusalem to fulfill their part of the covenant. And I imagine them walking into Jerusalem, amazed at the magnificent walls and city on the hill. They go to the rabbi to perform the circumcision ritual. But this is where it gets interesting. It's actually a ritual. Well, Jesus is taken to the rabbi, and here is 
how I learned how the ritual goes. Uh, first of all, on the eighth day, it was common to announce the boy's name. And, and this will be the case here. Luke 2, 21. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So according to Leviticus 12.8, one can substitute doves instead of a lamb. Leviticus 12.8. But if she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her and she will be clean. So the sacrifice his parents provided was the equivalent of a lamb. So they would sacrifice a lamb for the true lamb in this baby dedication. The symbolism just continues and it's endless. Baby Jesus was taken by the priest with Mary and Joseph, and no doubt Jesus' invisible angelic bodyguard was there. The priest would use a special instrument to separate the foreskin, and then the foreskin is then pulled up and over, and a clamp is tightened to reduce blood flow. So a lot has changed in the rituals, but um, here's a blessing from Shabbat.org, uh, which may have been actually said over Jesus um, at his circumcision. This, was, this is the process today. The priest recites the blessing. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us concerning circumcision. Then he begins the circumcision, and the, the father recites the blessing. Blessing are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to enter him into the covenant of Abraham our father. And then everyone present would respond, just as he has entered into the covenant, so may he enter into Torah, into marriage, and into good deeds. And the process uh, has a few more blessings after that. But isn't that powerful? I love the blessing. Blessing are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to enter him into the covenant of Abraham our father. And that covenant has the blessings of Abraham a blessing to the nations. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Jesus would actually embody this. Jerusalem, who rejected him, would be destroyed. And those who accepted him would become the light of the world, the true city built on a hill for all generations, the church, a height that would never be turned down. Even today, the church, if it stood in true unity, could be the most powerful institution in the entire world if they would just unify and pray. Now, I can imagine Mary was probably pretty rattled after his circumcision. And, and then they left the priest's presence and went into the court of women. They stepped, and instantly two older, elderly, radical believers in Jesus approached Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. Old as they were, intercessors of great note, they felt and witnessed the Messiah they've been praying for their whole lives. Luke 2, 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. So he came to know by the Spirit that Jesus would come in his lifetime. Okay, so how did he know that? I mean, the Holy Spirit actually told him that he wouldn't die until he saw the Christ. Isn't that amazing? And that amazes me. What faith? A man, a man of faith, he had to wait until the very end of his life to witness what God promised. And he starts his words stating that, I am now ready to depart. And I mean, he must have been really up there in years. Every day he must have been waiting. Um, you know, how old was he? He's getting out of bed every day. Is today the day, Lord? I'm... Well, the Holy Spirit fills him, and then he speaks, Luke 2, 27. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace 
and according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Isn't that amazing? He truly knew it instantly. He knew the Messiah. And one of the things that Jesus said is, you didn't know the hour of your visitation, but here's a man, Simeon, that he knew him when he was eight, when he was eight days old. He said, my eyes have seen your salvation. And he went further. He said, salvation for all people. What an expansive thought for this age. Then he says, he will bring revelation to the Gentiles. That's for you and that's for me. And then just to not leave mom and dad out, Luke 2, 34. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. And this is where I picture that he kind of just stares at Mary and he says these words. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Now imagine Mary again. She's a thinker and a processor. She ponders all things in her heart. And here we are. Simeon says a a sword will pierce her soul also. No doubt the blood spilt on this day, the first of Jesus' blood spilt, was a precursor of the pints that would be shed on the same streets. And I believe at this very moment, Another lady, an extremely old lady, arrives. She's probably over 100 years old. I mean, she's seen it all, and she was a temple. She's been a temple intercessor the whole time. Um, She's witnessed this entire construction effort of Herod. The elderly intercessors were the only ones on this day that knew the day of visitation. Luke 2 36. Now, there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanael, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with the, a husband seven years from, from when she got married. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And I imagine all the priests around them just rolled their eyes and figured these old, very old intercessors didn't know what they were saying. They probably blamed senility. I mean, no, God chose to bring out the revelation of himself at this moment to the youngest and the oldest in society. The most unlikely. He chooses the children of the age, the foolish of the age, to deliver his message and entrust his wisdom and great truths to confound the powerful and prideful of the age. To conclude this episode of Message to Kings, there's a Catholic feast actually named the Feast of the Circumcision of Jesus. I actually found a sermon out there by Martin Luther. It was it was celebrated, it's normally celebrated on January 1st, and the reason for the feast is that the circumcision of Christ is considered the first time the blood of Christ was shed and thus beginning the process of the redemption of man and a demonstration that Christ was fully human and of his obedience to the biblical law. Man, so I've never heard of this celebration, and I don't plan on celebrating it, but it makes the point. At his circumcision, it is, it's truly the first time the blood of Christ was shed, and the blood of Christ sets in motion the words of blessings, the fulfillment and the rite of circumcision, this Abrahamic covenant, and then these blessings of Simeon and Anna. And I think the key here is is just simply this. It's the blood of Christ. It connects the blessings of Simeon and the new covenant. The blood of Christ is our salvation. Simeon said, I've witnessed your salvation. It is by the blood of Jesus we are saved. It was first shed here on this eighth day. The atonement for sin is the blood of Christ. Not only this, but Jesus would make a new covenant based upon his blood. This is crazy. And at his when he starts doing communion the first time, in Luke 22, 20, he says this. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So the old covenant was the Abrahamic covenant. The new covenant is of his blood. 
The pouring of the wine in the cup symbolizes the blood of Christ, which would be poured out for all who ever believed in him. Jesus will fulfill the requirements of the law in 1 Peter 1, 9, the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus' sacrifice paid in full the debt of sin and grants us salvation. Hebrews 9, 14, his blood will make our consciences pure from useless acts so we may serve the living God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, because the blood of Christ has redeemed us, we are now new creations in Christ. It's not about works or anything to that degree. It's about faith that his blood fulfilled the requirements of the law and makes a new covenant. It redeems our flesh, our soul, and makes us new. Aren't you glad it's not about circumcision now? In essence, there is a circumcision of the heart, a renewed commitment to God. This is what God requires, a holy communion, a new covenant, which the blood of Jesus sets us free and gives us authority to walk in true love and blessings of God. Enter into this covenant today. Walk in the power of his love, the blessings of God, and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and enter his rich covenants and blessings beyond what you can think or imagine. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Message to Kings. Feel free to visit the website, messagetokings.com, share the Facebook page, or visit our affiliated Etsy store, Steadfast Gifts, or if you want to chat, email us at messagetokings at gmail.com.